teams of the Trump administration, and there's a difference between President Obama and President Biden, specifically on trade and manufacturing and you know geopolitical positioning versus China. So that, that, there's that there's that shift. And again, I apologize for I, you know, I don't mean to give to an extended an answer. Um, but uh, so what is the era that we have now? So the era that we have now is essentially one of uh, it, it, one of disruption and fragmentation uh, as the U.S. again is sort of deleveraging from China. Uh, and so you have sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the blocks maybe, you know, reforming into uh, trading blocks with, uh, with China and possibly the BRICS nations, uh, you know, uh, forming their own trading network and maybe uh, uh, reducing their use of the dollar as a medium of international exchange. I think that is a scenario that companies need to be prepared for. Because again, right now you can say that the um, you can say that the rock has been returned to a molten lava state. And so, what are, what's going to happen five or ten years from now? Uh, I, you know, I, I think that it's very much uh, a possibility that you you you'll see a return to more dependable uh, a more dependable trading environment. But I think that the the competition between the U.S. and China is going to be about And so companies just simply have to have that in mind. Like these are the different scenarios where you know maybe a little bit of a, of a, of a reduced emphasis on China as a trading partner. But um, I mean, the U.S. itself, the U.S. government is, is, is says you know we're not trying to decouple completely from China. It's more about um, you know reducing exposure uh, and, and especially exposure to other companies that there may be uh, you know, threats or would come to supply chains. I believe that uh, it's a. Uh, Countries need to have a strategic uh, plan on, on this front. Uh, I don't. I, I, I actually don't think that the risk is, uh, is is is the right terminology. To me, is the preparedness what we should be using. What what is uh, required to be prepared in case of and do a lot of what if analysis in a proactive way so we can create master plans of capabilities. That if, if we incorporate those capabilities into the supply chain. We are in a better position to extend the continuity of the business in days of, in, in the bad days, in days of adversity. In the meantime, we need to create, of course, uh, uh, the infrastructure that we've been talking about, technology that we're developing to, to facilitate continuity, and also create a conscious, uh, ethical conscious and legal conscious that uh, I would love to hear from the needs a bit more on that. Uh, so, so, so, so, because this is the one that is not the, the one that we every day are tangibly <coughs> moving and planning for. Uh, uh, it would be great to have more perspective on this front. Uh, the exciting part of this uh, involves humans, right? And a human, when there is a human aspect on it, uh, we cannot deny uh, a big balance. Uh, of course, companies uh, creating uh, values, creating products, but it's all being created and uh, put out of the world uh, through human uh, touch, right? And uh, my uh, opinion on that, uh, the obligation and responsibility, uh, especially from uh, the government side, uh, should include uh, more uh, balanced, uh, especially on working conditions and uh, human rights perspective. Uh, they should uh, implement policies uh, focusing on that. And that's the way uh, how uh, it is going to be sustainable in a way. Of course, you can uh, find or replace people in, uh, in supply chain. And uh, maybe you can get rid of the uh, human rights perspective. But uh, you cannot get rid of the environmental aspect of whatever is replacing the human. Uh, so uh, my uh, focus is uh, child labor is a huge problem. And uh, environmental aspect of what is uh, produced by the company is, is a, a huge problem. And uh, construction quality or working conditions uh, the physical working conditions of people are uh, the, the main everyday things. And uh, when I uh, when I 
we look at that uh, in all corporate and government uh, sites, uh, especially uh, governments uh, should take a leading role on that and balancing uh, that relationship. Uh, and I think uh, UN's uh, target for 2030 uh, by uh, having consciousness uh, of supply chain raised, uh, especially third world countries when they are uh, involved in the supply chain uh, process. And, and so maybe over the uh, governmental uh, structure, uh, UN or uh, those kinds of uh, organizations that uh, take leading role, or are already taking that leading role, uh, by putting targets, specific targets, to reach by, at the end of some specific time. Uh, that's, uh, I am deeply moved, especially when I'm involved with the uh, auditing uh, processes of the global companies' uh, supply chains, and not direct supply chains, Indirect supply chains also uh, should be monitored very much uh, in detail. Uh, I might, you know, especially cosmetic sector, the animals, uh, big brands, their direct suppliers may not use uh, ethical, uh, they use ethical ways to uh, supply the products, but how about their indirect supply? So, governments and the companies have, I guess, uh, emphasis responsibility and obligation to follow uh, and look closely what's going on really in uh, agriculture, cosmetic, textile sectors. Those are main uh, three uh, problematic sectors that face the difficulty on their supply chains on, on the plastics. Thank you for the important perspective. It's, uh, uh, it's easy to continue on the, on the way we operate today and not consider all these ramifications. Uh, I, I will probably reach that with a, a conversation about uh, technology development. Uh, but before that, I would ask uh, Professor Daniel to, to share with us. Uh, when I, I want to go on with the comments of, related to my to the lady when she was talking about geopolitical problems. As you know, uh, historically, protectionism and free trade has been always, uh, you know, were um, uh, aspects that were balancing in the uh, not balancing. I mean, you have free trade for a while, then you had again protectionism and then free trade again. So um, now. Uh, since uh, the COVID and, and then especially uh, after uh, with these uh, uh, problems with the war in Ukraine and now again these uh, new problems in the Middle East, uh, we realized that the model based on the globalization uh, is getting, you know, it, it has, it's not going well and so for geopolitical reasons uh, we are assisting a sort of de-globalization especially for the production so we, we are going towards a model uh, of a world more fragmented uh, more regionalism big region and uh, okay so that has problem effects on uh, on the supply chain and uh, so I mean at the end it seems that uh, we are moving toward a complete different model with respect to let's say five years ago and I think this new fragmented model based on regional big area you know, uh, will last for a while maybe for decades but the reasons are geopolitical uh, you know also economical because uh, you know globalization was based on the idea of saving costs uh, reducing costs you know? you you, uh, you move your production to china because it costs less and then from china to vietnam to cambodia because 
cost, cost even less. <laughs> now they realize that this kind of model in terms of supply chain doesn't work anymore for several reasons. One is economical, the other is environmental. And uh, so, as I say, we, we are really changing the, the paradigm. And uh, this, is, uh, this means that we must uh, uh, figure out a, a different kind of uh, uh, work scenario and a different kind of uh, supply chain which maybe won't be any more global but uh, will have other characteristics that will uh, look at sustainability uh, and so on. And, uh, but of course, this is not as easy transaction. You know, this is uh, what I have. You know, my, my feeling is that no. So, um, you know, how do you, how do you figure out this uh, new? I'm asking you, how do you figure out this new, let's say, um, a scenario of supply chain and fragmented uh, um, uh, world? Let's say. Okay. Thank you. Great question, uh, Daniel. Thank you for sharing it. Uh, I, I think there are uh, it's a, it's a multi-vector uh, answer for that question because it's not a simple, simple one. Uh, uh, starting with the design of the supply chain based on the business requirements that you are dealing with and the geopolitical environment that you are in as well. And, uh, and then what can you predict that could go in a different direction so you can prevent from that? Um, in, my, in my years of experience in supply chain management, I have concluded that the only solution to any of these or more problems is to build capability in your operation. Uh, bring capabilities and bring uh, adopt solutions. And uh, we're talking visibility, we're talking uh, uh, having uh, uh, uh, planning uh, uh, skills that go beyond just the production of today and goes to analyzing for options of uh, scenarios that can be uh, in place and, and, and what capabilities you need to activate the different scenarios. Uh, so I don't want to take a, a, a, from the panel to answer questions, but I, I felt compelled to, to talk about that part because I think the capability drive that supply chain practitioners and leaders in the industry, as well as governments, is, is a non-stop uh, area of work that we need to go for. And not because you need the, the, the capability now, but you will need it in the future. So it's like having vitamins for tomorrow and not just having an aspirin for the headache of today. So you need to combine the two of them to keep a healthy supply chain in place. Um, in this, uh, technology, of course, plays a big role. And I'd like to hear from David about, uh, about that a bit more. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, I, want, uh, I want to uh, uh, tell my perspective about your uh, question. Uh, because of uh, when we, uh, we are talking about such a sustainable uh, supply chains, uh, because of the uh, situations and some conflicts of the countries, as you know, globally, uh, now uh, there are uh, restrictions and some other problems at the supply chains. Even they are very cost effective, like you know, Malaysia, Vietnam, of China. Uh, but uh, what I am thinking uh, in, in my point of view, uh, even uh, these solutions are uh, named as sustainable, but uh, sometimes, as you know, you cannot go with the same uh, country or same uh, companies uh, at the, uh, for the uh, products uh, that you need. So I'm thinking that uh, we must have some options and evaluate these uh, options. Even we, are, we have no problems with our supply chain at that time. So we can switch the other uh, solutions uh, very easily. Uh, and uh, this is about the relationships, actually good and sincere relationships uh, with the international uh, communications and people actually. Uh, so I'm thinking uh, at that way. 
and uh, for the technological side and, and uh, logistical side, uh, as you know, uh, maybe uh, at COVID time, actually, you remember that uh, the freight uh, costs yes, four times, five times more from China, especially. Uh, so, uh, in my point of view, uh, we must consider more countries and more companies and uh, to focus on really good relationship with each other, actually. So it can be a solution for all of us. Thank you. Sorry for the, uh, sharing that perspective. Is there any, any other uh, point of view on this topic uh, from, uh, from from the audience? Anybody wants to share an experience or something like that on this area? Okay, so I think uh, we, we could talk a bit more about the geopolitical aspect of this. I think that's where uh, more energy is being in the conversation uh, today, and it's really the one that occupies our minds uh, maybe more uh, uh, lately. Uh, the geopolitical things uh, in, in the world and how supply chains should be ready for that. And, uh, I'd like to hear the perspective that uh, Lauren brings on that because uh, he, he has a good visibility from, from the first economy of the world and uh, what are they thinking to do, uh, not, not necessarily from the infrastructure, but how do we analyze the trends in the geopolitics uh, uh, point of view, Lauren? So, what would be some signposts that we can look for? Yeah, well, I, I'm thinking that uh, we, we, we live in a world where uh, there are, uh, differences are differences are popping up and the differences are creating trends and trends are creating separation and separation is uh, inspired by lack of trust which is uh, affecting really the dynamic of doing business, the dynamic of uh, in general. Uh, uh, of course, supply chains are being a core part of the of the enterprise when it comes to supply chains are in challenge. Uh, uh, I always uh, think that uh, there is uh, an area of supply chain capabilities that intercepts with uh, geopolitics and intercepts with uh, methods for negotiating better, a better playground for supply chains to be effective. And, uh, uh, and I like, I have curiosity, I don't know if you have visibility enough of what uh, uh, the United States uh, seems to be doing in this area. Sure. sure. Well, I, I guess, you know, one of the trends we um, I watch for is, is, you know, China's status as uh, the, uh, the world's factory floor, is where they're making it, is the world's factory floor. And someone mentioned uh, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, India, uh, the countries in Asia that are uh, are taking some of that market share, some of that production market share. Uh, actually, uh, several years ago, uh, three years ago, uh, Mexico uh, actually uh, Mexico's labor costs uh, fell below those of China. So China's labor costs are actually higher now uh, than Mexico's. Well, for the U.S., uh, which you mentioned as a, as a, a very large economy, uh, the, the um, you know Mexico offers uh, a number of advantages, including proximity. Mexico's right next door, and so that you're you're shipping it a lot less, uh, a lot less further. Uh, and so you know, those sort of trends are very important to watch. Uh, does China um, does China sort of stabilize at a particular level? Uh, or do we see sort of a dispersal of the uh, uh, manufacturing imports uh, from all of these different nations? Like, what are the trends in, uh, in, in U.S. Uh, productions of Mexico uh, is uh, steadily taking over as, as the U.S.'s lead partner? But what are, the, what are the geopolitical trends in Mexico? Mexico has a presidential election on June 2nd of 2024. Um, you know, will that alter the the political trajectory of Mexico. Um, the, they, they've, they've struggled a lot with, with uh, local violence and issues, uh, which is very important. You know, when we think about the, the pressure that China has been under, uh, you know, which is really an extension of ESG. Um, and it goes to uh, you know something I mentioned at the at the, at the beginning of the uh, of the panel on uh, 
social media. I mean, they sort of everything is everywhere now because of technology. You can see things. You can have videos of <coughs> you can have videos of uh, what's happening in, uh, in Xinjiang province uh, with the Uyghurs, which has put a, a lot of reputational pressure on China. To put it in sort of coldly analytical terms, uh, something that is obviously intensely emotional for lots of people. Uh, but that, but that's, that's, that's, that's part of what's putting pressure on China, is, is a lot of people feel like, well, maybe they're not, you know, maybe we have criticisms of, of the way that uh, the government operates there. Um, and so that, that's where we're leading a shift to. So China's status <coughs> as, uh, as being the preeminent global manufacturer, uh, how, how does that, that that's, that's what I'm trying to watch. Um, uh, what is the uh, what, what is the status of Mexico? What is the evolution of Mexico? I think it's a very important country as, as the U.S.'s uh, uh, top trading partner. Uh, what about the uh, the evolution of some of those key other alternative uh, manufacturers? Like uh, very closely to Vietnam, Indonesia, and India. Uh, India is now the most populous country in the world. Um, so what does that do as far as the, the geopolitical status that India has? I, I think, you know, I mean, India has not been sort of, um, you know, a global influential heavyweight sort of at the, at the, in, in, in the top rank of globally influential nations. It's something that uh, I, think, uh, I think their government has talked about. So uh, this India, you know, with this sort of newfound confidence of being the most populous country in the world, um, does that mean that uh, we become, uh, you know, a, a, a world that is, uh, that is, uh, you know, did, does India become one of the major poles of the, the global geopolitical ecosystem? Very good. So, so yeah. This is exactly the type of perspective I was looking for. I, I see that uh, we we gone into, of course, okay, COVID hit us, and uh, supply chain practitioners were basically at the uh, uh, uh, defense at that point. So we saw what we. Everybody saw suffering. And then we had a war coming up and another war coming up, and more dynamics like that will happen. In the, in the meantime, uh, China, for example, is creating infrastructure globally. And uh, uh, at the end of the day, when the distractions of all this noise goes down, we're going to be in a situation where, where international trading needs to be re examined. And, uh, so, so, of course, I want to hear first your perspective. You know, I don't know your name, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, uh, on this and the topic we were talking before. Yeah, thank you, and I wanted to comment on what uh, Lauren uh, said, and I want to um, be a little bit provocative uh, to the end. I mean, you're speaking from a US point of view. That's provocative that's, is good. That's, that's, that's okay. Good that's okay. You. US. I, I try to uh, to speak from a to the end a more neutral uh, European perspective. I very much believe, I mean, what is this all about when you're talking, oh, Mexico has now lower wage in China. Uh, the, the underlining uh, conflict of all that, to my opinion, is the competition between the US and China. And the United States do not want to be overtaken. <laughs> they do not want China to further develop in terms of technology, uh, military, academic, science, power in the world. So, and what your country has been doing since a couple of years, you said 2015, maybe even a little earlier, they have tried to many very smart strategic instruments to prevent the China is developing uh, to the better and the China is overtaking. I mean, if you ask the Chinese, they would talk about a trade war from the side of the US, sanctions, you try to put a lot of regulatory um, um, pressure on your tech companies, nobody is allowed to, to, uh, to send certain parts to China anymore, and now I become even more provocative, and you have been very successful in making the European Union in particular with regard to the Ukrainian war, quite dependent uh, on the United States. And I meet many people in the world when I go to international conferences who address me as a European and to say, why don't you have a, a, your own foreign policy? Why have you become so dependent as an ally to the United States? Uh, everything 
against China. So this is a, this is a, a geopolitical two two powers in the world are fighting uh, one versus each other, and the rest of the world is actually uh, you know not uh, profiting from it. This is a little bit more precise than I personally think. I think things are not only black and white. And the Chinese are, of course, a very strong uh, and strategic um, uh, powerhouse. And now they try to to uh, to, to uh, react on what's happening in the world. It's also not beneficiary for for the South and for Europe. But um, to to end here, I I very much believe, and I'm uh, full of concern about that. That this major geopolitical competition is leading to a, a lot of fragmentation and is leading, we're talking here about supply chains, uh, to a situation for global uh, uh, economy, for regional economy, which is not beneficial. And so on. my question or whatever, um, do, you, do you think, maybe addressing this really to, to the US, uh, uh, when will this end? Are we, will there be, uh, can we have hopes? We have concerns, but can we have hopes that leaders of the world, um, well, the ones we have right now, maybe really, if I think of Trump, I get a nightmare. Uh, but you, you said clearly, uh, I, I really heard this, uh, and I think you're absolutely right, that Biden hasn't changed much, in particular towards uh, China. So uh, what, what should happen? What can we give us hope? Um, um, that we are looking for, let's say, again, a more harmonious uh, global community. I think uh, there's a, a, a thank you for that provocative point of view. And uh, uh, yes, this defines pretty much the scenario where it's happening geopolitically and how it affects the supply chain operations in general. This is uh, very, very clear. Uh, I, I, I will uh, take the risk of being, being very simplistic in my, my response to that. Uh, the, uh, uh, because I really think uh, we abandoned uh, in Europe a bit the idea of creating a comprehensive supply chain, not supply chain, a comprehensive industrial strategy. Um, and and uh, it's easy to have a big power of countries that are dependent more on financial services and things like that than having really uh, industrialized uh, operations increasing. Uh, so we have let this go down or stagnant for a while. We didn't invest in, in, in our supply of materials in Europe enough, and uh, we transform materials into products, but we import a lot out of the materials. So uh, uh, it's probably, a, a, it was smart, but it wasn't refreshed as a strategy along the way. So as soon as President Biden creates a, uh, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, it puts us in a situation in Europe like, uh, what do we do now? Uh, because that, that, will, that will affect us significantly. And, uh, and uh, we didn't have a strategy, uh, a proactive uh, strategy that comprehensively bring along all these elements for the better uh, uh, uh, enterprise development, industrializing development of Europe. Uh, so, and I know this is a discussion today at a high level in, in Europe, but that uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, it's very important, and we are a little late, but there is time to catch up still. Uh, the United States, with, the, with this uh, IRA uh, thing, uh, uh, really made an uh, important strategic move uh, the, for the first time after many years. Many presidencies that didn't really tackle it. And uh, Biden tackled it, it, it, it goes through, <laughs> and now it's in place and it's working. It's a lot of money. It's, there is time because it's not uh, an overnight uh, intervention. Uh, it, will, it will take time. But now, what uh, the response from other regions that are powerful from the trading standpoint and uh, uh, consumption standpoint, like Europe, is uh, uh, need to have a strategic response and not a tactical one. We cannot expect that uh, the China United States differences will fix our problems. We need to to start figuring out what is the path forward for us and how do we leverage that difference. In the meantime, you know, we, we, China has invested in infrastructure almost the same amount of the GDP of Italy, for example, you know, so like three trillion or something like that, of, of infrastructure in outside China infrastructure. So uh, uh, they're all win, they're gonna own uh, trade you know, uh, with that. And that's, is that a problem? No, not necessarily, uh, the, but, it, but it is a, 
a train that might be a problem if we don't have strategic thinking around it and we don't bring capabilities to, to the game. I'm sorry again that I'm making my opinion be part of it. I'm a moderator, not a, but, uh, but uh, this is a very, very big area of walking commission made. You want to add something on this? Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I, I, I love the comments. Thank you so much. Uh, you, we, we all know what a, what a Venn, Venn diagram is you know, with the circles and the overlap. So if we take the circle of uh, the ideals, uh, the, the, the, the, the principles espoused by uh, an entity, an individual, or a country, and the, the, the second circle is uh, perceived self-interest uh, of, of the, in the country. Uh, you can usually figure out what uh, someone is going to do if you know what their perceived self-interest is and what their values are. And so the U.S. throwing elbows at China is squarely in the overlap of that Venn diagram. So your answer, like, well, is the U.S. doing this because uh, because they have you know principled objections to some of the things that China does, or are they doing it because it's they're in their self-interest? Which is it? And the answer is yes. Of course, it's both. Uh, you know, China has, um, they, they, have, they have done things that, uh, that, that people have concerns about, uh, from, from hacking, from IP theft, to other things that people have, uh, have, uh, have, uh, have said about, uh, about China, uh, and not just from the U.S. Uh, but obviously it is true that, uh, that the U.S. is, um, is the, the largest economy in the world, and China is the second largest economy in the world, um, and they are far and away the two largest economies in the world. Uh, both growing uh, economically, and that that creates a natural competitive tension. That I think you know, I think you know, it's it's, it's going to be a competition. Um, uh, the answer to uh, Europe's involvement, I would say, is that Europe's involvement is going to be based on Europe's own self-interest. And the Europe, the, in Europe sees the U.S. as uh, as uh, a very valuable trading partner. Um, the uh, and, and I think over the last uh, year and a half, you've seen the importance of the U.S. relationship uh, has increased uh, in two ways. Uh, Gustavo just mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act, which was the uh, which was the summer 2022 legislation uh, that, that, uh, that sort of expanded and reformed the way that the U.S. is promoting electric vehicle adoption in the U.S. Um, this was uh, also. Uh, you know, an initiative to promote domestic manufacturing. So a lot of the European auto manufacturers, you know, we took this as a shock. Wait, wait, wait, wait, wait, wait, wait. You're not cutting us out, are you? Like we have, we have, we have an agreement. Um, and so uh, uh, most of the European governments, uh, certainly the ones that, that care about auto manufacturing, have been negotiating with, with the U.S. government to say, all right, how, how can we, how can we make this right? Because uh, you're not, you know, you, you, you may have concerns about imports from China. And uh, China's dominance of the battery supply chain, by the way, that's a big part of the story too, is the fact that China controls 90% of the, uh, the value chain for, uh, for critical minerals in, in, in, uh, in electric vehicle batteries. And if the U.S. is going to make it a policy priority to transition to electric vehicles, there's going to be a very strong competition there. Uh, Europe, of course, also uh, is, uh, is uh, dealing with the effects of the invasion of Ukraine and the fact that America's uh, energy exports to Europe have suddenly become a lot more important. Uh, and so, and so you know, Europe does have an interest in, in, uh, in keeping that relationship strong, which does, which does uh, impact China. Um, now, you asked for a hopeful note, so it's important that we have hope here. So I, I'm gonna, uh, you know, I'll note that um, you know, I think it's very unlikely that we're talking about uh, you know, another, another war or something like that. We have, of course, we have, we have two wars right now, so let's, I think we're full up on wars. Let's, let's not have any more wars right now, but I think the idea that you would have, um, you know, that uh, the tensions would escalate beyond right now what is, what is essentially a, a trade war, I think are pretty unlikely. I think that the, uh, the, uh, the, the Biden administration, which has kept basically all of the Trump tariffs uh, in place, there's been some softening on the solar tariffs, uh, partly because of the green energy, energy transition being such a priority for the Biden administration, but essentially with all the tariffs in place, I think that that, that you know, those, uh, those elbows that the, uh, that, the, um, that the countries are throwing at each other, and China's, China has the ability to throw some elbows too, uh, both on uh, de-dollarization, which is a very important trend uh, for everyone to, to keep an eye on, the, the, um, you know, the U.S. dollar being used in 
fewer international transactions. Uh, uh, India, Russia, uh, even France, Argentina, other nations occasionally denominating uh, international transactions uh, in, in non-dollar currencies. Uh, that's a very important trend. China also, I mentioned Apple, the Apple iPhone, uh, for the first time ever over the last couple of years, current generation iPhones being manufactured somewhere else other than China, which is India. Uh, and by the way, there's, there's, there's another side to this, this trade. You say China is sort of, you know, oh, we're being you know, victimized by the U.S.'s trading measures. Yeah, but you know, India is benefiting, and Vietnam is benefiting, and Mexico is benefiting. So every, every trade has another side to it. Uh, but uh, China threw an elbow uh, back at, at, at Apple by uh, banning uh, government officials from having uh, uh, government purchase uh, iPhones. So you know, if you're a Chinese government official, you don't have an iPhone. Uh, and that, that you, know, uh, you know, in the moment when that happened uh, uh, a couple months ago, uh, that knocked a chunk off of Apple's market capitalization, which is currently, uh, which at the time was $3 trillion, which is just a, a mind-blowing amount of money. Uh, now I think they're about $2.8 trillion. Uh, and I think, you know, it, not so much like, oh no, we're not going to sell you know, a few thousand iPhones, but more about, what is the, you know, is this going to, could this be a disruption, you know, to Apple over the next couple of years as they find a new equilibrium uh, with, with China? But I, I mean, I would say, you know, uh, there's going to be tensions, there's competition, um, but I, I, you know, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think it leads to war. <coughs> uh, I think that that's, that's pretty unlikely right now. I think that's the hope. The hope is that, you know, this is a, a fundamentally a business transaction. Uh, where you know it, it does create difficulties for some people, but I, I don't think it gets. You know, I, I don't think there's any indication it's worse. I, I guess there is not a single answer. That the supply chain design will depend on different conditions, and you should have flexibility. Resilience also will mean the flexibility to fract, fragment your supply chain or move operation from one place to the other, or change the carriers or directions or routes or streams of supply chain to the marketplace. And, and all of that should be considered. Today, we don't do that. We just run what we have. And we run it good. And we work on efficiency of that and cost reductions of that. But we're not strategically thinking of, about all, all the other alternatives that are there that we could tap on and we could use and practice on an ongoing basis. So I, I, I, I, I think it's very important that we keep that in mind. So it's not now bringing operations to, to our home to control the doors. That's, that's not going to get us too far. We need the other countries for sure. Uh, developing regions are, are better at, uh, uh, at raw material production because they don't need the investment for transformation uh, of those materials into products. And uh, the rich countries can pay for that, so they produce, import, produce, and then export to those countries, so uh, uh, uh, to, uh, to every country. So it's important that we understand this interconnection will not end. Unless we have, we are so powerful economically and and and and, and, and, and geographical, topological, et cetera, et cetera, that we can put infrastructure for everything in every country, which is never going to happen. So because of that, international trading becomes a very important aspect of keeping supply chains going, and creating strong capabilities in that area needs to happen, and we all need to pay attention to that. Uh, in my in my humble opinion, this. And everybody, any, any opinion, any challenge, please, uh, uh, this is the right moment to push on us. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, much valuable speeches. Uh, it's very thought provoking. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I will have two questions. I'm, I'm Barish and I'm based in Ankara, so I will have two questions. One will be more turco centric, so to speak, a practical question, since we have uh, mentioned the uh, US centric, Euro centric views. And, uh, let, let me uh, put a Turco-centric question and one more, uh, more philosophical one. My Turco-centric question will be, we have heard from the mayor of Gaza, and also from his excellency minister, the uh, opportunities uh, Turkey can provide, and, and a, a very maybe useful metaphor they have used, okay, you take a plane from Gaza or anywhere in Turkey, and in three to four hours, you can fly to uh, very important commercial centers around the world, so, I mean, that was one of the reasons why to invest in Turkey. Uh, so, uh, do you think, I mean, my question would be to all speakers, uh, do you see opportunities for Turkey in this regard, um, 
for diminishing the uh, risks uh, of well, supply chain uh, problems uh, and um, standing uh, as a sort of key, uh, relatively peaceful geography among all these volatile regions. Uh, would Turkey, uh, Turkey play a role in, in, in diminishing supply chain risks? And the second question will be much shorter. Um, it, do you think um, deglobalization or regionalization is the best reply to diminish supply chain risks? Uh, and the, the, the reason for my question is, uh, until today, uh, for decades, the globalization rhetoric went hand in hand with uh, the concept of human rights, democracy, rule of law, and liberal values. So, um, and if uh, we, we take it from this point of view, if deglobalization will be deliberalization, would it would it think, would it this bring another risk to to the to the global peace and well-being? So, thank you. Actually, uh, I am thinking uh, we have big opportunities as our country, uh, especially for the United States. And we just uh, a couple of minutes uh, ago we talked about this uh, opportunity uh, usually. So, uh, actually, uh, we are closer than uh, China, and, uh, and also because of the uh, exchange rate of the currencies, we are almost uh, close to their uh, cost, you know. So, uh, on the other hand, uh, we know that, also you know that very closely, production quality uh, is high and uh, we have uh, high qualified labor and workers, engineers. Uh, so I'm thinking uh, it will happen soon and it will start with uh, some of the product at least and uh, after this will be es escalated. Uh, and for your second question, this is my opinion. Actually, uh, globalization <laughs> uh, and uh, or not, but I am thinking that uh, it is not only uh, one. Uh, you cannot choose one to other, you know. And as uh, with the other uh, discussions, uh, uh, my perspective, we, we need to. Adapt, you know, it is not our choice, it is a need, you know, uh, for United States, with China uh, relationships, or, uh, uh, and also, as, uh, as we talk so, uh, there's the other side of the, uh, you know, coin. So, uh, one is sometimes uh, good for one, one is not, and sometimes the opposite. Thank you. First of all, um, especially some sectors are leading uh, in supply chain, especially in, in, for Europe. Uh, I was working uh, before, uh, like in 2000, uh, beginning of 2000, uh, Fiat uh, Corporation to watch. And uh, I was responsible for uh, legal uh, coordination. And uh, the factory uh, that Sofash has in Sorbusa was uh, selected uh, the best factory out of Italy. And the quality of works and the quality of uh, materials uh, and the quality of work life, uh, they're uh, perfect as I was also uh, working there. And I saw uh, during my years uh, while I was working there, uh, signing uh, many international spare parts contracts uh, all around the world through Turkey. And, uh, and also, uh, Topash also signed many strategic uh, intellectual property based, not just work based, but intellectual property based uh, products. Uh, jointly developed by France, 
Italy and uh, Turkey. So I have a strong belief and I uh, know uh, that Turkey uh, not just has the capacity, but also is doing it uh, for decades, uh, especially in some sectors. So I am, um, I'm, I'm strongly, uh, I'm, I'm very strong, I'm very positive that Turkey can uh, take more responsibilities on uh, other sectors as well, with, with, with, uh, with, with success. And one other thing, uh, for, uh, for your uh, second part of your uh, question, is, is um, and uh, from, from the uh, lady from the uh, Germany, we, we, we, we cannot uh, lose hope. That's, uh, we don't have that luxury. Uh, that's, uh, and I see uh, from the bigger picture, everybody, uh, every country has uh, their stance. And uh, we need to do what we believe, right? And we uh, need to support what we can do best for uh, all of uh, all of humanity. And I, and I see Europe is taking, um, uh, in the bigger picture, uh, they are, I see, the regulator of the world. Uh, of, uh, on, they are great on writing laws and enforcing new uh, ideas uh, and bringing up new uh, laws and regulations and new standards uh, for the world. And uh, each country has the responsibility to take the best uh, for, for all of us. So that's my two cents. Very good. And uh, there is a point of view there, please, with the microphone and the first row and the second section. It's uh, a bit uh, weird that uh, all the question, the answers for the questions has come from the Turkish firm, <laughs> people over there. I would prefer to you, you guys to uh, uh, answer the question uh, I, first. I, I, I use a lot of words. I, they don't I, <laughs> so uh, this is a very fruitful conversation. Thank you for that. I couldn't hesitate myself to add something. Uh, for my humble opinion, uh, we always talk about the United States against China. And I feel that Europe is as good guilty as the uh, United States against China. So they're doing the same, uh, same uh, I'm sorry for that, but hypocrisy. Uh, what I believe is uh, the supply chain has changed uh, uh, forever uh, at the pandemic because uh, during the pandemic, we all, all the world, uh, um, uh, understood that we need China, India, Vietnam, all those countries for manufacturing. Because the, you know, the powerful countries, wealthy countries are investing in businesses uh, for, for more, more profitable businesses. They are doing electrical cars, they are doing apples, you know, iPhones. Uh, high-tech materials, but the world also needs toilet papers, handkerchiefs, or the masks. So, therefore, I think we're going to need all the manufacturer countries all around the world forever. But in terms of the, um, the diversification of the uh, wealthy ones and the unwealthy ones, or the thing that you, you mentioned earlier, that the influential nations in terms of that, we still need time. I mean, the United States or Europe or other wealthy uh, nations are going to influence the world. But the countries like China, India, and all the others, they need time, more time to influence the rest of the world. So until that time, I think we're going to have these arguments all the time, and we're going to see the uh, conflict in between these, uh, these nations. Thank but, you. Yeah, but I believe that we need manufacturers, and Turkey, Turkey is a manufacturer, 
and our exports almost more than 60% of our exports are going to Europe. And this was always like this, maybe more than that. And I yeah. believe that we're going to, going to have more exports to Europe. Thank you. Okay, I don't, I don't want to quote you. Uh, we only have like two minutes more. Okay, I'm sorry. So, uh, two minutes more, and then negotiate one off loss in that one. So I will let us, uh, Lawrence, who will take half of that time. We will do, do, the, we'll do the lightning round. I can do it even less. Please. Lightning round. Okay. Turkey has an amazing opportunity. Turkey is absolutely one of the nations that I think, and I think is viewed in the U.S. And you know, it, it's set off, and then Americans don't really think about you know other nations beyond their borders. Where is Ukraine? What is this Ukraine country? I've never heard of it before. Uh, but Turkey is uh, Turkey has an incredible opportunity. Uh, the U.S. imports 500 billion dollars worth of goods from China every year. For Turkey, the number is 12 billion, two and a half percent. About 12 billion. Um, I, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who's from Turkey. He grew up in uh, uh, Izmir, and uh, he was saying, "This is yeah, this is what we should be doing so much more. Turkey is a powerhouse." And I said, "Yes, but don't you see this is great news? This means that there's an opportunity. There's so much opportunity to grow because Turkey can be wealthy." Uh, so yes, Turkey is definitely a part of it. Uh, deglobalization does not need to mean deliberalization. It's a great question. I think the answer is, I mean, the U.S. is not decoupling from China. Uh, there is a shift going on. Our elbows are being thrown. It's a competition. I mean, these are, these are big players. These are adults. Um, you know, I, I think the word hypocrisy, I, I, I would say, look, it's, it's, it's self-interest. Is the U.S. conducting policy in its own self-interest? As an American, I certainly hope so. I mean, there should be some attention to self-interest. I mean, they shouldn't be, they shouldn't violate international norms, and there should be discussions of where those lines are and things. Um, but, uh, but all very exciting. But Turkey definitely has a very important role to play U.S. trade. Okay. The, the sweet answer and the quick answer is yes, there is hope. There is more than hope. There is action. And this country is powerful. This country is amazing. People are really connected. And uh, uh, the doors are there to, to, to conquer really the world. Now, fixing the supply chain resilience is a matter of, it's a collective matter. It's not China, U.S., it's not uh, Germany or Western Europe, whatever. It is it's a collective issue we have globally. And, and, and we owe to the consumers, people that need the toilet paper, and the people that need food or need uh, Ferraris, you know, all, everybody needs a supply chain service in them. And, uh, and uh, we, we have taken supply chain in a very tactical mode, and it's time to make it, uh, make it not only collective, but also strategic. And, uh, the, the, where everybody plays, and there is not a one way or another, or a favoring a, a, a country versus the other. It has to be really a make sense solution that orchestrates the capability and the strengths of everyone together, so we can really bring it up for prosperity matters. Because this is not just uh, to do business, to do good business, sell, sell more. It is prosperity. We don't prosper with no supply chains not being there. At, uh, at, uh, Wherever you produce something, you create a city next to production. Wherever you create supply chains, you prosper in jobs and uh, opportunities for people. So the obligation we have as supply, I don't know how many supply chain practitioners are here, but uh, I dedicated my life to it. And uh, uh, uh, this is the mission we have, to really propel prosperity through uh, supply chain capabilities that really leverage everybody for everybody. So with that, I'd like to close the session. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here and uh, this distinguished panel to accompany me.
to stand up, to join me, to mourn for all the souls who have lost their land, their families, their sisters, and their part of their bodies. The reason why I'm here today is because our original moderator, May Shireen, could not make it because her sister was murdered just a few days before this. I show my deepest sadness to her and her family. Not only May Shireen could not make it to a conference to be the voice for all the women in South Africa, but also many of your families, your friends, your relatives, or strangers we see on the TV who lost their rights to be just a human. So woman empowerment is not only just about women. Women are part of human beings, and women empowerment is indeed humanity. I will invite all my dear sisters here and brothers here, my fellow panelists here on the stage to join me for a moment of silence, to mourn for the dear brothers and sisters, children, women, fathers, grandfathers, children, who lost their land, their families, the part of their bodies, and even their hope. We will not, and we shall not. There's a reason for us to be here today. And now, please kindly join me to mourn suddenly for the souls who lost their lives with us, and we will remain silent to pray for the peace of the world and the involvement of humanity. Thank you. Remember also who have fight to lost their lives and that we have the 
the privilege to sit here and to discuss what we can do to make humanity great again. Today, me and our panelists will be speaking about women empowerment, to raise awareness, how we can women make women great again. So, first of all, I will introduce our panelists here today. We are having four distinguished guests. I will give the floor to all of you. Please, Carol, let's start from you. Herkese günaydın. Moderasyon için çok teşekkür ediyorum Meryem'e. Ee, ben e, önce kendimi tanıtmadan önce, e, tabii kendi şehrimdeyim. E, bugün özellikle e, aynı zamanda tıp doktoruyum. Gazete Girişimci İş Kadınları Derneği Başkanıyım. E, uluslararası birçok kongrede e, sayfalarca İngilizce sunum yapıyorum. Fakat e, Cumhuriyetimizin 100. yılı nedeniyle kendi şehrimde ve kendi ülkemde e, Gazi Mustafa Kemal Atatürk'ün de söylediği gibi Türkçe dilinde ve kendi dilimde bugün özellikle sizlere bilgilerimi paylaşmayı tercih ettim. <gülüyor> Elbette ki global bir konferansta e, kendi şehrimdeki kadınların da güçlenmesi için ciddi mücadeleler veren bir kadınım. E, burada çok güçlü kadınlar var bu moderasyonda ve bu konferansta. Öncelikle e, Mr. Frank'e çok teşekkür ediyorum ve Büyükşehir Belediye'mize çok teşekkür ediyorum. Bu kadar güçlü bir organizasyonu şehrimize kazandırdığı için ama bu panelde daha fazla e, kadınların iş hayatında olması için e, birkaç e, seans olmasını isterdim. Tek bir seansımız var. E, bu yüzden e, aslında biraz daha bu ruh, daha fazla bu konunun daha uzun şekilde konuşulması. Çünkü hepimizin kanayan yarısı e, konu içinde, zaten panel içinde bu konudan bahsedeceğiz. Çok teşekkür ediyorum. <gülüyor> Good morning everyone, I am so happy to be here today. Uh, I'm Lebanese, so the last week I was just uh, wondering if, uh, what I could do most to help the people in our region. And I think I decided that our voice today is what matters the most. We are among here the people who are leaders in their industries, who are activists, who are politicians. And I think we, through this international dialogue, we actually try to find solutions because apparently the people in power are unable to do so. So potentially we can try to push for such positive impact at the end of this panel. And this is why we're discussing. It's going to be completely from the heart. And we're going to try to be like as interactive as well as positive as possible. So for my background, I have a very techy background. I'm a computer engineer, 12 years of experience. I've worked in multinational companies, startups. I worked for one year and a half also in NGOs, but mainly I was a political activist in Lebanon, also advocate for women's rights. So I really hope that today through the discussion, I'm going to try to focus on the social boundaries that we have, especially in what we call the conservative also area, just to explain what those conservative means, to talk about what we can do in the professional but also political aspects. And I really hope that this conversation can be beneficial for everyone. Thank you. That's incredible. Yes, today we will take numerous questions from the audience, my fellow speakers, sisters from you. So please feel free to raise your hands and share the floor with us. Thank you. 
Great to be here. It's great to be in a pattern like this. Great to be in the Casa. Everything beautiful. It's great to be in the Casa. I'm the one who shared this. I have a lot of texts. Uh, in one seminar, when I tried to tell uh, a few of them, uh, one guy said, are you not, are you a person of normal confidence? Why do you have to say all these titles? So I will climb on one title that's on the chair of W20. W20 is global 20 or G20. And uh, during my time uh, in GIDAC, the Global Entrepreneurs Association of Turkey, which I am one of the founders and at that time chair of the board, uh, we, for, we were looking for uh, a tool for women's advocacy. And in that women's advocacy, it's a right. It has been a right since so many years. It's our right also to be on the senior chair. It's our right to be on the board. It's our right to be an artist as women. But that is not, yeah, yeah, yeah. The answer is yes, yes, we also have rights. But it never works. So we need to, in, coming from an industrial corporation 20 years, I said that we have to tell the value, the value creation people can make in decision making. And I got that opportunity in W20 where G20 was saying, come over and tell us what we can do to force fear to develop. Thank you very much, Dr. Golden. Thank you. So let me emphasize the topic of today is uh, around women empowerment, especially we're talking about since numerous results and studies have shown that women workers is beneficial for all, for nationwide, for the city, and for the corporation, and for the family. Why we do not see an increasing number of women in so many organizations. How do we go against that idea of preventing more women being our co-workers and even leaders? I pose this question to myself and my fellow panelists and also all of you sitting in the audience. I'm very honored to have a few of our male counterparts here in the audience. So applause to you all. Thank you for making Women in Common great again. And we need you to make work, we need men. So feel free to bring more men into our world. And so let's open the floor and give the floor to all of our dear speakers. The answer to the questions first. So um, I'll invite Sarah to start with to answer the question. Yeah. Thank you, May. Thank you, everyone. As I said, I want to try to cover like three main topics, especially that, as you saw, the theme of the panel today is one to focus especially on women coming from conservative areas. I think this is also dedicated to potentially, like, I'm going to speak again, I'm going to say that transparently. I come from a very conservative Muslim village, and I was able to, like, I didn't earn my like, freedom directly. I have worked extremely hard for, like, 35 years to be able to get ownership of my life, my freedom of speech, my religious views, my political views, but it wasn't so easy. Uh, but I really want to emphasize this point here, that when we say conservative areas in our region, it doesn't mean extremism. It means that this is the only way sometimes our society, our community, our families feel they can protect us. It's by being overprotective. It's not because they don't want us to be happy or to succeed, but it's the only way they know to protect women because we were still perceived, even for today, as vulnerable individuals. So I really wanted to clarify this context, especially for our international friends. It doesn't come from the idea that women don't matter. No, there's overprotection. It comes from love. It doesn't mean that I agree. That's I work hard to get out of this, but I really wanted to emphasize this one. Concerning the professional part, which is like very important, I think the way that I started getting my freedom is by being financially independent. And I think this is very important for women. Whenever we are dependent, then we are still, in one step, our communities didn't really like people as we want at the same pace. So I think the way to take ownership is to be at least 
owner of our own mind uh, somehow. I think it's very important you mentioned how we have men in the room. I think men allies are also very important. And uh, there's a misconception always in our region, I think it's globally as we were discussing, not only in our region, that women cannot actually have both be successful on the person, personal and professional aspect. And to tell you the truth, the first time I was thinking seriously when doing a women empowerment speech in our region is when I became a mom. Because now I'm a mom, I'm a wife. So now, yes, I can talk about the professional part because I could feel what is the perception that is in me to see. So I really believe that we can do all. It's our way to tell the younger generation, young girls, that no, we can actually have this right balance but if we have the right partner. So our allies should be in our home, in our personal life, but also in the companies and the professional part. As when we talk also about like uh, the communities being surrounded with like-minded people. So today I'm assuming most of you already that found like-minded people here in which you can have this fruitful discussion. Sometimes we don't get the support that we need from potentially our families or others. So being part of empowerment communities is very important to make us like continue this path and give us motivation along the way. And finally, what's very important is the political part. I'm going to be brief also about this one. Mainly for the political side, I was a little bit surprised at this conference that most of the people were trying to avoid talking about conference. And I'm talking about people from all around the world, which is very problematic for me when it comes to freedom of speech. Uh, which is really being more human, which is making sure that all the theories about the diversity, inclusion, freedom of speech, they are great on papers, but honestly, we are unable to take them to the practical part. And I believe that women can have a huge role in making those amazing theories to work in our communities, in our corporations, but also at the political level. So our voice matters, and I came here today because I wanted my voice to matter. I wanted to translate and to bring to the table what exists on the ground because misconceptions and free judgment would actually fuel as well the speech. So we are also there. So yeah, thank you, Mace. Thank you. thank you, Sarah. That's brilliant. Uh, I will continue to invite my panelists to give their thoughts uh, in the first round and then we will continue the discussion. So in the meantime, any questions from our audience are more than welcome. Please. Yes, uh, thank you so much for sharing your story, Sarah. I, I think you have such a huge perspective, uh, especially growing up in the region that you have, um, and reframing that that our, that conservatism and what it can mean, and how people in a Western perspective can maybe misconceive it. So I appreciate that. Um, I am coming from a Western perspective, having grown up uh, in the United States, and although you have a perception of having a great deal of freedom for women there. There are still huge disparities. And since we are speaking about women in the workplace, um, I think it's important to highlight that both in the workplace and in the political realm, the U.S. has a very long way to go when it comes to equal representation for women. Um, just wondering, by a show of hands, how many of the, the audience or maybe on the stage, believe that women are making progress in the workplace in your own home country. Okay. China, we're making progress. That is really good to hear, and I think that's super encouraging to hear. Um, but even though we have progress, we have so much further to go, uh, particularly in the U.S. and globally. Um, in the U.S.A., for example, women make an average of 82% of the pay rate that their male counterparts make. So just from a salary and pay transparency standpoint, we still have a wage gap to fill in. And that wage gap widens when you add in the various factors like being an immigrant or being a woman of color as well. So um, yes, we're making progress, but we also have to keep our eye on the prize and keep advocating for ourselves with our position in the workplace. So um, that would be my thought, my opening 
thought on that as well. I'd love to uh, pass over as well to Dr. Mayla. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, öncelikle aslında buradaki panelin tabii ki ana konusu, ana yaklaşımı e, kadınların neden iş hayatına yeterince ve üst sayıda giremediği ya da eşit sayıda giremediği. Fakat e, biz bunu elbette ki e, muhafazakar bir e, ülkede yaşayarak e, mücadelesini verirken e, aynı zamanda globalde de bu sorun e, çok aktif şekilde e, mevcut zaten. Yani bu sorun sadece bizim ülkemizin sorunu değil. E, öncelikle bunun algılanması lazım ve o yüzden de bütün uluslararası kadın örgütleri bu konuda e, ciddi savaşlar, ciddi mücadeleler veriyor. Şimdi burada önemli olan elbette ki çözüm noktalarını konuşacağımız bu panelde e, elbette ki e, genel olarak bakış açımız e, çok değerli. öyle söyleyelim. Az önce panelistlerimizden biri de söyledi. Biz e, burada bile bu kadar uluslararası bir panelde e, ciddi anlamda e, konuşamadığımız konular var. Ve bu panelin özellikle bu oturumun çok daha açık, net ve anlaşılabilir şekilde e, konuşulması arzu edildi. Ve biz de kadınların cesaretine bu konuda inanıyoruz. Ve maalesef iş hayatında olamamak ya da yeterince yeterli sayıda olamamamızın çok büyük nedenleri var. Tek bir e, noktadan ele almak çok çok zor. E, çünkü kadının hem iş hayatında hem ev hayatında hem annelik görevi gibi misyonlarını bir arada yürütmesi çok yetenekli ve başarılı olsa bile toplumsal olarak, sosyokültürel olarak e, tüm toplumlarda bazı yargılar var. Bu bizim ülkemiz için çok daha fazla geçerli. Dolayısıyla bu konunun çok ciddi ele alınması lazım. Fakat bu ele alımı mutlaka eninde sonunda e, en nihayetinde e, siyasete de bağlamak zorunda kalıyoruz. Çünkü siyasi idarelerinde elbette ki oy kaygılarıyla toplumun değer ölçütlerine belli oranlarda saygı ve muhafaza etme noktasında e, söz sahibiler. Dolayısıyla e, toplumun aslında sosyokültürel durumunun yükselmesi gerekiyor. Asıl sorun burada. Çünkü hani hepimizin de söylediği bir toplum baskısı nihayetinde e, kadının iş hayatında yer alması elbette ki zorlaşıyor. Fakat burada özellikle sivil toplum örgütlerinin e, kadınlar adına çalışan sivil toplum örgütlerinin biliyorsunuz eğitim alanında çalışanlar daha fazla kız öğrenci eğitimi yönünde e, ele almaya çalışıyorlar. Daha fazla kız öğrenciyi okutursak daha fazla kadın da aslında iş hayatına daha kolay girebilir bir e, duruma erişiyor. Aslında buradaki en önemli konu daha da temele indiğimiz zaman çok yeni bir çalışma var. Ben tıp doktoru olduğum için biraz çalışmalardan bahsedeceğim ve kendi ülkemizde yapılmış Süleyman Demirel Üniversitesi'nde çok yeni tarih 2021 e, 2022 yılında yapılmış büyük bir çalışma var ve bu çalışmada açık ve net şekilde kadınların iş hayatında olamamasının ana nedenlerinden birinin e, muhafazakarlık ikincisinin ise maalesef siyasi ve politik nedenlere bağlandığı bu yayında ortaya çıkarılmış ve binlerce kadın üzerinde yapılan araştırma sonucunda çok değerli bir çalışma aslında ülkemiz içinde. E, Global'e yansıttığınızda da aslında gelişmekte olan ülkeler için en büyük sorunlardan biri. Biz genel olarak şunu söylüyoruz. Dünyanın yüzde ellisiyiz. Yarısıyız. Ama ne haklarımız, ne iş hayatındaki varlığımız aynı oranda değil. Ben yine küçük bir şeyden daha bahsetmek istiyorum. Global ee, olduğu için. OECD'nin e, çok e, yeni olmayan 
Ee, %65-70'ini kadınlar yapmakta olup fakat maddi ve gayrimi yani paranın sadece yüzde birine sahipler. Tüm dünya üzerinde. Yani aslında işi kadınlar yapıyor. İş hayatından bahsetmiyoruz. İşçi sınıf olarak da. Burada ana nokta aslında ortaya çıkıyor para. Parayı ne kadar sahip olduğunda dünya üzerindeki güç dengeleri de bu sistemle çalışıyor. Yani kadının bir şirkette maaşı olarak, CEO olarak çalışması bile aslında bazı şeyleri değiştirme gücüne eriştirmiyor. Ancak maddi güce çok yüksek oranda ulaştığında o zaman daha fazla söz sahibi olabiliyor. Bu tür dünya ülkeleri içinde de genel olarak böyle. Çevrenize bakın inancı, görüşü, siyasi düşüncesi ne olursa olsun maddi gücü yüksek ve iş hayatında olan kadınların söz sahibiyeti daha yüksek. Bakın kültürel demedim, eğitim demedim. Aslında bu hepimizin de sorunu çok uzatmayayım tekrar söz gelecek zaten konu döndükçe teşekkür ediyorum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leva, for your passionate speech. I, I'm learning Turkish, just start with. So I don't think I understand anything of it, but I got the spirit. So I just got some information from my sisters in the audience that you don't understand either. And many of you are not equipped with this uh, translator. How many of you understand this passionate speech that I'm curious to know more? How many of you? Would you mind, Dr. Can I say something? Yeah, please. Two of your panelists do not speak Turkish. I'm sure we have other guests here. So if we would really appreciate it if you could speak in English today. But uh, the translator is uh, going back today. Uh, 
and they told me, you cannot do this. So I think we have to hold each other's hand in the whole world and move forward. Otherwise, it doesn't work. In 1903, a Ford Motor Company was established in the US. And to that Ford Motor Company, they needed to make cars. You have to fetch the door of the car and put it in the assembly line, developing assembly line, and you have to put it there. So no woman allowed it be made man. The roads were in mud, muddy roads, so no woman can come over here, so only man. Uh, and uh, this is very important. At that time, uh, okay, it was okay, only man. But now it's digital age, and we really have very good health as women. We can understand details. We are very good at digital understanding. We are very good in sustainability. That's why WB20 is established. We want women to be part of G20 because we want sustainability. We don't want one growth and then fell down from war. We want sustainable growth. That's why first time ever, <laughs> was not invited to Ford Motor Company or GM following five years later, but now in 2014, G20. When you remember G20, it's a lot of men and very few women, Christian Lagarde or Chancellor Merkel, very, very little. They invite men, invite women to be a part of G20. Tell us how can we go forward with both uh, views. You would understand in China we have one voice and another voice. I was uh, in the board, I was invited to the board of ABB first. But at that time ABB had a lot of very important guys in the board. And I was the only woman and I listened to them. I don't agree like out of ten. I wasn't agree in five, but I shut up and said that. This is the first time in my board, I didn't say anything. One out of 11 is two to voice your voice. And after the meeting, I was the uh, secretary general. I had to write the minutes of the meeting. And uh, what they have decided is wrong not applicable in Turkey, as head of uh, legal and many other things. Not applicable. I, I wrote the minutes, but I put into parenthesis this decision was not Then at that time, very senior, very capable uh, country manager called me and he said, uh, can you come to my room? And uh, his secretary, elderly lady, now you are fired. <laughs> you wanted to be a secretary? I was general secretary. No, with this call, you're fired. I said, let him tell me. I'm here to talk to him. He called. You called for him. So let me see why I'm fired, at least. Oh, I'm telling you, she said. Okay, I said, and I went to him, and he said, you have a chair there. You should have spoken at that chair at that time. You see the writing in parentheses. This doesn't apply. This doesn't work. This is not wrong. So we need to voice our voice. Personally or jointly. Joint voice is so important for all of us. Uh, because when one country, uh, whatever uh, the statistics or research says, is doing well, all the other countries are trying to push that development back to where it was. In the W20, in the formation of the W20, uh, we wanted in uh, our NGO and through the ministers, through the political life of Turkey to the ministers, uh, we said let's form W20 because in 2014 
the G20 said we want to spend five five five five five five five five five five five This is a target in America, target first time ever in the history of women's movement. And that target needs to come to be followed up. So let's form W10. They said, look, we cannot form W20 because we are the president, but we need to get the approval.
So we should raise our children, girls and boys, to understand that women don't want to take over power, that we're just fighting for equality and good balance. Bravo! Amazing! Uh, how many of you are moms? Just raise your hand. Okay. 
for women introducing them to what is needed currently in the workforce i think this would be a huge push for women actually to get this opportunity to be able to shine again potentially for the wrong reasons but <laughs> but then i think this is also positive and i'm going to take a lot of time thank you so much sarah sarah i would also like to add to that as well possible just quickly and just Great point. Actually, I want to add to that too. We have gen two gentlemen just raise your hands. I will give the microphone to you very soon. Thank you, Sarah. So about upskilling, I'm here to ask you a question to the audience. Uh, who of you think you are upskilling yourself as a professional? Great. Both men and women raising your hands. And the way I was educated in China, my mom would always tell me to learn something close to ours, not science. And same to my sister, not to my two brothers. So here, well, most of us are mothers here. It's a passion to us to educate our children. Upskilling is not only for us to fight against for our career, but also the way and our mentality in raising our kids. The very recent uh, research from Claudia Golden, the Nobel Prize, uh, Prize laureate, laureate, just found out that uh, the gender pay gap would never close until we have couples equality. The couples equality starts at, starts at home. When we have equality at home, we might have more equality in the society. So when we have more equality in the way of skilling ourselves, we might have more equality in the workplace. And now I will give the floor to two gentlemen out there, please. Hi, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Rob Garrett from Singapore. Um, I'm husband to a wife who is uh, accelerating towards the C-suite, father to two boys. Um, we have a number of female CEOs here, but um, I know, uh, forgive me, Leila, I think I pronounce it like that, you're working for a, a, a, a is she not here? Yeah. yeah, you're working for a major international brand. Um, I guess one of the questions is that uh, here we have um, representation from women who are leading businesses, but all too frequently, women who lead major international brands that resonate with the public do not speak out on female empowerment because uh, they get frowned upon. And I can cite, you know, Jane Fraser from City, the CEO of City, does not talk about what it's like really to be a woman leading a business. She talks about what it's like to be a CEO leading a business. And uh, my question to you, Sarah, as well, is I work a lot with family business. They're, they're my investors, uh, co -invest. Um I, I resonate with what you say. I used to live in Dubai, and in fact, an unknown fact that people don't recognize is that actually about 50% of the wealth across the Middle East region is controlled by women. Um, they might be protected within their family circles, but they actually control the wealth. Um, how do we get more people in positions of power and wealth and positions of influence and power in big corporate businesses to speak out on this subject, not just on these stages in amazing conferences, but in places where they'll be reported in the press and average Joe consumers will hear about their stories. So thank you for your question. So just to rephrase to make sure all the answer to the question properly. So you're saying that we already have 50% women. Most of them are powerful, but their voice is not like uh, loud or like high as we want to. So how do we encourage them? They don't choose to speak out because they don't want to be seen as creating a problem. Because honestly, it's hard. Like, I thought I'm a political activist. My uncle is a deputy in, in the 
Parliament now in Lebanon, I was politically activist against, for example, uh, the political party that he represented. That was not easy. When we talk about women empowerment, sometimes we just ask, are we creating a safe place for women to voice themselves? We cannot ask women to voice themselves and then leave them go to their same communities and societies without being able really to give them a safe place to be able to voice themselves and still be protected. Uh, same for the financial part. Uh, May told me something before we come here, not to mention that my uncle is a part of it, but I'll say that we're not part of like the 1% percent in it when no, we were really. <laughs> the financial part was not really something that pushed us moving forward. But I mean, women need also themselves that we would do to drive this moving forward. I was working sometimes in a project in, in, in the Gulf, and I was more senior than the majority of the people in the room. I was the only woman there. And then suddenly they asked me, can you take a meeting of minutes? And I told them why, because just I'm the woman here. But like, it, it takes a lot of time practice. I didn't say this 10 years ago. Most probably I would have taken the meeting minutes. It takes time, it takes patience, courage. But I really believe it's only the communities, the like-minded people that we go together, not only in conferences. In Lebanon, I was part of like two, three communities only for women empowerment. They give us something that potentially we do not find in our close circle. It's really because they've been through the same challenges. We learn from each other. Uh, this is the only way to move forward, but definitely it's not easy. And this is why many stop in the middle road. They don't really progress at the end because it becomes very complex. And sometimes it's also dangerous for them to continue in the way that they're doing. So this is going to be a long process. We need to collaborate, all of us, to make sure that those voices are going to be protected so they are able to be as loud enough to have a really actual change. Thank you. Uh, I had that dilemma because I was not a, a civil society leader. I have been a civil society leader for some 12 years. Uh, earlier than that, some 20 years, I was a CEO for ABC, a several over institution. Engineering company. And then, as I mentioned, I was the only, I started as the only one in the board, and I left as the only one at the board. It's not very easy to pull the woman up, and it's not very to, uh, easy to ask the woman to speak out. Uh, I asked one lady in my time, I want you to be promoted. You are very talented. You have a procedure and you will get the vote but you have to ask for it. I cannot leave your house so why don't you come over and he she said please allow me not to step forward. Why I said she said I have one daughter and I'm after raising her and I'm happy with my salary and I'm happy with my job. I don't want to endanger that by speaking up too much and I don't want to endanger that by going one level up because it's a competitive level. You have seen what that happened at that level. So we have to read that. I mean, this is not a race to man's seat. Man will always get their seat. Janet Burke is not. Hey, get out of there, I will sit there. It's not something like that. But we have to, all men and women need to support women to step forward. That's needed because we need to listen to their voice because they are going to add value. They are going to say something, not uh, continuously fighting. They, they promise they said, promise me you're the feminist. What is that? I said, we don't want feminists move in G20. Aha. Uh -huh. But now G20 has a civil so, so, social society, civil society. A very good uh, way forward because we have to advise to G20. But we were asking the industrialists, women in business, just say a few words. We have a group called Women and Power. We take G20. But they don't want to waste their voice there. Say, 
because they don't want their turnover to go back. Because the hype they have in their industry is one woman, one man. And if she voices too much, shut up, is the answer that they will get. I had shut up when I was trying to form W20, convincing 10 countries, okay, it was our government's uh, job, but we were trying to support there will be a, something like this, are you going to say yes or no, whatever it is. During that time, I had a lot of questions. They said, for giving G20 an advice, it's a report of 500 to 1 million dollars. Do you have that money? We were resting here in the country, but we of course didn't have that money to spend on the children. <coughs> and I said, no, but we had a list and we have worked on it. And that list is still valid for the school. We want women to be educated. Without the education, they cannot educate their son and daughter. We want women to be employed. Without being employed, they cannot earn money. And when women earn money, they are after savings. And if you have studied a little bit of economics, when savings are there, investments are there. Prosperity comes. We have to save first. Unfortunately, studies say that when men uh, earn money, the money doesn't go home. Unquote is lost. I don't know why. But when women girls, they save it for their uh, kids' study, their family study, and uh, education and health. If you are healthy and educated, then you have an opportunity to create value for the world. And that's what we must do, create value for our environment and create value. You want to ask something in general? Or Please. Um, if I could also just add to that just very quickly, um, as someone who worked in journalism for 20 years and, and now handles a lot of C-suite communications for women, um, I think we are making progress in that realm. And yes, previously women were afraid to speak up and tell their stories, but we're having a lot more progress with women speaking on their infertility for example, on the unique challenges of being a woman in a leadership position and being expected to fail, um, the glass clip phenomenon. So I work with uh, companies like Hitachi and, and other large corporations to identify those women who are willing to speak to those controversial topics and move the conversation forward and um, show how women can continue to make progress in the corporate world. So thank you for that question. Um, hello, my name is Sean, I'm from Australia. I'll be interested to hear the panel's perspective on quotas. Um, and I'll give you some context. Uh, the two major political parties in Australia, uh, the Progressive Party has implemented a 50% quota for women to be on the ministers. Uh, their philosophy is that you can only be what you can see. So they're trying to, I guess, inspire young girls of Australia to become political leaders. The Conservative Party believes that it only should be taken on merit, which is quite ironic because half the men in that political party probably didn't get their on merit at all. So I'd be interested to hear your perspectives on quotas being political parties or organisations. Yes, I'd be interested to hear that. Thank you. What a great question. So, open floors. Quota because I hear what you're saying. Again, going back to 
how clear is my total rate on papers, but how we need, we need to make sure we have the right processes for the execution. So and I saw that um, we've discussed this before that let me start by saying I am with the quota, but I do not agree that's being implemented properly. So in a lot of corporations, they want to have 30% women just to market that, oh, we have diversity and inclusion, we have 30% women, but they don't always do enough efforts to get the best women there. And this would backlash on the long term. So this is why I want to say it transparently. But I don't think the problem is in the quota. I think the problem is with the proper outreach, because we are overwhelmed with amazing women existing out there, but we're not doing enough to get the best. So it's not only to have the quota, if we're not getting people who are more qualified than our men who are like, for example, trying to get the best uh, place, if it's a corporation or in politics. In Lebanon, for example, the majority of women are the wife of someone, the sister of someone, which doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> so we need more people, they are there, but you cannot put quota if you don't have the right mindset and the right approach of getting the best people in the best place, men or women. Again, this is not a place. I fully agree with you. It's not a race to actually, sorry, it's not a race to have the best, but it's a full package. We cannot have part of the equation and then say, oh, it's going to be not as perfect. I would I would support her of course and it has a lot of variance with thirty percent of the board places and in many spaces in political leadership. But it's not the only solution. I agree with her. Though I don't agree with her that family voters bias. If they are on the board, they need to act as they are a board member. And I see many of my friends, they do act as a board member. They do, I mean, I was in my, I told you a few moments ago that in the first board meeting, you cannot act like a board member of 11 people where 10 is men. But in the next board meeting, you need to speak up. And I did speak up, and I'm not shutting the up since that. So we need to speak, we need to see what the family is doing. We need to see the quota given woman is doing. What value creation is she after? And I know in Australia, great woman, great value creation. Thank you. Uh, you say everything is good in all the world, but uh, in Turkey and in the Muslim countries, it's very different. So it's not uh, depend on the uh, economics, it's also the nature. So uh, the women in uh, Turkey and the other Muslim countries, uh, they couldn't have the education and they couldn't have, they, they have a vision uh, uh, to be a mother and to be a, a wife. And it's very important for the uh, Islamic religion, you know. And it's uh, very different in our country. And I must say something for the women that educated also and have a big position or top position uh, in their uh, business. Uh, they didn't support the other selves. They didn't support uh, the women to other women. It's very important. And this this was, uh, I always say, uh, Yeah. 
it is get women back. So we must think this because lots of Muslim countries in all over the world, I think uh, the, uh, near uh, one percentage three Muslim countries, and it's very crowded. So it means lots of women can't educate it also because they
I was trying everything to raise the kids. I was trying everything to earn money. Uh, working at other houses, including doing everything. At one point, I decided, and he was telling me, don't go out. Stay at home. I have so many stories. Uh, rural woman, but this one said, this guy is not going to earn money. He's not up to earning money because I was going to my neighbor and asking him, employ him, and it, he was unemployable. Then I went to the marketplace, bought books, and made um, things like this, whatever it's called, uh, tablecloths. Very easy situation. I started making table coats. First I sold them in the village, then I went to the market and sold them in the nearer villages. And then I went to the city and started uh, selling them in the city. And when he comes home, he was knocking my door, not beating my house. So money makes the difference. Woman needs to earn money, earning capacity. And earning capability goes from education to employment and to entrepreneurship. She jumped from home to entrepreneurship, but it's not very well for every woman to jump from uh, home to uh, entrepreneurship. The way in between is education and employment. And employment is very important because of the income of the woman. When you are employed, that also happens. I have another case in another city. She says, no, it's COVID. And I'm staying home because the grocery store is closed. And I said, my husband started, started beating me up. Earlier, uh, because uh, they saw the uh, blackness in my face when I go to work, uh, they say, what is this? And gave me, uh, go home. We cannot let you have in the front office or in the uh, cash, as the cashier with bruises in your face. So you need to go home. And he, um, can we uh, tell the story, just summarize, since uh, we're running out of time? Thank okay. You. So, working and money earning capability is the change we carry. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to be brief. So, for me, there are three axes on how we can build tangible and Where The first is starting from home. I, when we talk about like religion, I think some, somehow it's some of like a part of our work. We still have arranged marriages, so I think it all starts from choosing the right partner in all of this approach. I've been part actually of an abusive relationship before, so I know that's not working. I was also given as an example before I get married that don't be like her. She succeeded in her career, but don't be like her. So I was <laughs> given as a bad example because I'm not a wife. I'm not a woman yet. So, but I think at some point we need to accept that it's going to be hard. We need to embrace this fact, but we need to think about ourselves. We need to plan our future and how we are happy. I cannot plan my future in a way to these people that my tomorrow or the day after not be in my life. But I need to accept that it's not going to be easy. And this is why the communities are important. To give me the part that sometimes my like small family or like society are unable to give me. So this is for me when it's regarding the home part. When it goes to the professional uh, acts, for me, the policies inside the companies are important. We talked about quota, but it's a whole procedure end to end, how we're going to do it. And for me, if you are in a company that doesn't like, it doesn't share the same values, it's okay to leave. There's nothing that would let us stay in a company. We're always afraid for the financial part. I told you I didn't come from a like, wealthy family at all. So this uh, sense of security, no, I want to stay in this company just to get my salary by the end of the day, but that becomes very toxic and we lose ourselves along the way. So whenever we feel we are in the wrong place, we need to start planning how to move out. We are working 10 hours a day, we need to enjoy it. No work is perfect, but I think values and ethics are like top priority and where we choose to work. Concerning the third act, which is, I think, policies are very important. Violence against women, you mentioned this, so 
now we're still lacking a lot behind when it comes to violence against women. In Lebanon alone, we saw that we had like tens of cases of violence against women, women who died because the law doesn't really protect them as it should. We also said we want women to voice themselves. We need to give them again a safe place. This is where civil society is important to give them this safety to like to, to, to, to hold their hands and make sure that they are being protected along the way. And I think the last part, which is also very important, is financial stability. If we are not financially independent, we're not going to voice ourselves because we are afraid to, again, for financial reasons, not to be well supported. So there's a lot of work on all access, but we need to drive all of this. Uh, it's, it's a long path. I know it's hard. Again, I need to repeat that but the majority, although they share the same concept, they stop along the way. Gaza 
about it. And I would like to give an uh, example from my uh, family. Uh, it's my story uh, at, at the last words, maybe. Uh, my name is Zeynep, by the way. Uh, I'm the other uh, daughter in my family. And my father is a visionary guy, uh, actually, but uh, you know, uh, he married very early and uh, we are four, uh, three daughters and a son. Uh, and I'm a very smart and hardworking girl uh, in my family. And my, but, uh, and I wanted to go to university, uh, of course, with Lale and with Nisha, especially um, focused on education. And then uh, I went to university at Istanbul University, and but my mother encouraged me so much. Um, then my other sisters also, also go to university at Istanbul. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Wonderful questions. No, not questions, but it's my story. Just uh, we want to really talk about tangible actions, and we can share the stories after this. Is it okay? Okay. We have a few sisters who have been raising their hands. Uh, it's a good story, but... <laughs> um, do you want to share the story after we finish this? Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes. Öncelikle ülkemize hoş geldiniz. Doktor Berit Hanım'a ve Gülden Hanım'a bizleri temsil ettiği için çok teşekkür ederiz. Ama burada en büyük alkışı bence Fatma Şahin bakanımız alıyor. Ev sahipliği için ve sizleri bizlerle buluşturduğu için ve böyle büyük bir organizasyonu yaptığı için çok teşekkür ederiz. Gaziantep'in ilk kadın milletvekili, ilk kadın bakanı ve ilk kadın büyükşehir belediye başkanı. Tüm övgüleri hak ediyor. Kuşlar iki kanadıyla uçar. Ben Gaziantep Ticaret Odası'nın 111 yılda seçilmiş ilk kadın meclis üyesiyim. 30 bin üyeli ticaret odasının. Kadının rolü var, statüsü yok. Kadın uluslararası pazarlara ulaşamıyor. Bu konuda neler yapacaksınız? Bu çok değerli. Uluslararası bir etkinlik yapıyorsak kadının uluslararası pazarlara, ulusal pazarlara ulaşması için hepimiz gayret ediyoruz ama uluslararası pazarlara ulaşması için uluslararası federasyonlar ne yapıyor acaba? <gülüyor> ee, bizim şu anda yanında oturan Nihal Hanım e, Gaziantep'te Türkiye'nin ikincisi kurulan e, Kadın Yerişimci Kuluçka Merkezi'nin koordinatörü. 28 kadın Kuluçka Merkezi'nde üretiyor ve satış ve pazarlama konusunda ürünleri çok iyi olmasına rağmen ve sanayileştirilebilecek, endüstrileştirebilecek ürünler olmasına rağmen pazarlara ulaşır. En önemlisi çünkü ben de uluslararası fuarlar yapıyorum, bunu çok iyi biliyorum. Ve markalaşma. Lütfen tüm kadınlar, tüm dünya kadınları el ele verip bu pazarlarda bir network oluşturup e, destek olmamız gerekiyor. Çok teşekkür ederim. Önce Türkçe söyleyeyim, sonra İngilizce söyleyeceğim. I will say English in şey. ee, Aslında o konuların çok değinilmesini ben de istedim ve ilk konuşmanın açılışında belki oldunuz. Türkşehir Belediye Başkanımıza teşekkür ettik büyük bir organizasyon için. Ee, fakat şöyle bir durum... Evet, evet. Kulaklıklar çalışmadığı için ilk başta zaten Türkçe konuşmak istemiştim. Çünkü salonun geneli Türk olduğu için. Şimdi tabii ki tekrar e, İngilizce'de konuşacağım, e, İngilizce konuşacağım. E, şimdi bu panelin içeriği aslında e, iş hayatında kadının neden olamaması, panel içeriği bu ve bunun çözümü için neler yapmak ama iş hayatında daha fazla yer almak, siz çok kıymetli e, fuarlar düzenleyen bir güçlü bir hanımsınız. öncesinde özellikle söylediler. O için direkt Türkçe'de açıklayayım istedim. İş hayatında ilerleme değil, iş hayatında neden olamadığımıza dair e, bir panel içeriği ve politik içerikler ve eğitim içerikleri ön planda tutulmuştur.
kurtulacak diye öncesinde bilgi verildi. Onun için ben direkt net açıklayayım istedim. And now uh, I, I, I answer her. It's uh, not hard for me because it's in Turkish. And uh, I want to say uh, for the solution for. Thank <laughs> you. 